Hi everyone, welcome to Fuel Radio. My guest today is Dane here. Dane is an author, changemaker, speaker, and co-creator of Access Consciousness, one of the largest personal development companies practiced in 176 countries. During this interview, we talk about how to find hope when the world feels bleak, why fixing yourself isn't the solution for happiness, and why judgment is one of the biggest destroyers of possibilities. Now, please help me welcome Dr. Dane here. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. My guest today, as you heard in the introduction, is Dr. Dane here. And uh, he's, uh, we're, we're finding him in Houston today. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Rod, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, we're going to talk about some pretty heavy subjects, but you're, I know that you're going to, you're, <laughs> you're going to offer some, you're going to offer some hope. <laughs> but, I will do my best. <laughs> maybe we could talk about the problem just as we typically sort of do in these sorts of things. I, I actually work for an organization. I didn't mention this to you in our pre-interview conversation, but I work for an organization that um, is a crisis and caring line. So I'm well acquainted with the uh, statistics and the problems when it comes to depression and to COVID and all that kind of stuff. Our, our yeah. caller volume is up 22% compared wow. to before um, COVID, you know, so that if that's any indication, people, I mean, we don't, you know, we don't need any further evidence. People are definitely going through things as far as COVID is concerned. But rather than starting there, I'd rather hear, I, I, I'd like to hear more about your own journey. One of the things that stood out to me in your bio is that you actually set a date for your own suicide at one point. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and also you had a pretty difficult upbringing. Maybe you could, let's start there. Just tell us what it was like for you to grow up in Los Angeles and, and, and the challenges that you had just even growing up. Well, it was interesting because I, uh, my mom and I, uh, we were living in the ghetto because my mom had no money and um, we were living with a family where uh, I experienced a lot of emotional abuse, physical abuse, uh, sexual abuse, kind of every kind of abuse one could experience and in, including that, that sort of day-to-day -day sort of fear and, and that sort of thing. And, um, and it was interesting because so my mom and I were basically the only white faces you would see for eight square miles. And it was there that I learned that it's not actually the color of our skin or our sex or our sexual orientation that makes us different. It's who we are as beings. And that's also what, what binds us or not binds us in a bad way, but actually is an acknowledgement of, of our sameness. And yet some people choose to be abusive. Some people choose to be really kind, some pe but all of that is actually choice. And so I somehow, I don't know how, but somehow I got that sense at a very young age even. And so I'm a seeker, you know, from the time I was a little kid, I was always like, oh, what else is possible? What else is possible is basically my point of view. And um, when I was about six or seven, my grandmother asked me, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I went, um, happy. And she said, no, 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 you don't understand the question. Do you want to be a doctor? Do you want to be an actor? Do you want to be a garbage man? Um, I, said, I was like, yeah, as long as I'm happy. You know, and my point of view is you don't understand the question, you know, and, and that was my point of view. And I got to a place uh, a little over 20 years ago where I was starting my second chiropractic practice. I was living in Santa Barbara, California. I had this girlfriend that everybody thought was perfect for me. And we were, you know, on, on the road to getting married and I was dying inside. I had been unhappy for the better part of three years. And what I did was I was reading books on personal development business growth, healing, any subject I could find, because I knew there was something else possible. And I'm one of those people who would be going to weekend workshops and feeling like I had finally found the answer by the end of the weekend. And then by Wednesday of the following week, the universe would cave in on my head again, and my happiness would go away. And it was literally after one of those workshops, literally on a Wednesday, it's like, you can remember some things, no matter how far away you get from them, you know, they etch in your mind. And I remember for the first time in my life, truly knowing what it was like to give up hope. 
because even with the abuse, even with my family losing their business later and just all these different things that had occurred, I still had hope. And that day I was done. I was like, I don't think I'm ever going to have the life I desire. So I said, universe, you have six months. Uh, either my life changes or I'm out of here. And all I really wanted was to be happy and have a sense of ease, you know, have a sense of joy again. And I came across something called Access Consciousness a week later, and I had a session and I went into it literally depressed and suicidal with a date to end my life. I came out of it an hour and 15 minutes later with a sense of gratitude for being alive and a sense of joy. And I was like, wow, if it feels this way to be alive, I am in. Let's do this thing. So fast forward 21 years ish in the future, and I've been part of co-creating it for, for all of that time and, and letting people know that there are ways of changing things that are not what you think they are. They're way easier and they're way more dynamic and it's possible. Are you still a chiropractor? Are you still have a uh, by <laughs> by licensure? Yes, but by <laughs> practice, not very much. Um, yeah. Yeah, I found I found um, I became a chiropractor because I wanted to create miracles in people's bodies and their lives. And, mm -hmm. I, and this is a reality for me. I knew people who were doing this amazing work, <clears throat> excuse me, and I didn't see it happening for me. And now one of the great gifts of of doing access consciousness, being a co-creator of it is I see the miracles that I always wanted to create as a chiropractor, but now they're actually showing up and people are actually getting it. Mm. You, you mentioned hope, and this, this might be kind of a difficult question. And, and I would imagine with your involvement with access consciousness, you find you run into people that have sort of given up all hope, or am I just assuming something that's not true? Like, is there always a little bit of a glimmer of hope? If you've been doing this for 20 years, you, you've probably seen people coming from all sorts of different places on this. So um, do you ever encounter people that are just, just absolutely hopeless or maybe they're not coming to you in the first place or getting involved in access consciousness if they're you know without hope uh and just just wondering your, about your thoughts on that well i've i would say it spans the entire gamut from from people who because it really works well for people who desire for people who know something different is possible who are like i know there's more how do we create it but it also really works for people who are like, I don't think anything is left of my life. How do I change that? You know? And so I've seen everything, you know, there was one lady that I worked with who had fourth stage liver cancer and I did a session with her. And what was so beautiful about this to me was I never met this woman. She had never done any access consciousness. So she didn't have any basis for it and what we were going to do together. And all I did was I just, I just, bead with her you know i looked into her eyes i held her hands and we had conversations we used some of these access consciousness tools i use this energetic um way of addressing things that that i have available also and you could tell that from this woman who was told she had three months left to live that whatever was going to happen she had a sense of peace in her life and so i would say she would be one of those people who had basically entirely given up hope and I was at a book signing there. It was actually in Sweden this occurred. I was at a book signing there four years later. And this beautiful woman with long brown hair and bright sparkling eyes comes up and gives me flowers and a card. And the card in, inside of it says, thank you. And my personal assistant said, do you know who that was? And I said, no, I've never seen her before in my life. She said, that's the lady you worked on that had fourth stage liver cancer. Uh, apparently it worked, you know, apparently. But that's the thing is, is one of the great gifts I believe that we can be for each other is if we have a sense of hope still, if we know there's a possibility still, if we just be that awareness and be with people and interact with them, it's kind of like, I don't know a better way to say it, but it's kind of like it rubs off. It's like hope is one of those things that if we choose to recognize the gift of it and be it in the presence of others, it has the capacity to rub off. And I could think of nothing greater to be in the world right now as a contribution to all of us. I, I saw in one of your interviews, you're talking about uh, people's vibrations. And I would imagine if you're around people that are vibrating a lack of hope, <laughs> that's probably just going to multiply. And if you're around people that have hope, 
you know, same thing in the, in the opposite, uh, in the opposite direction. True story. We're like big friggin tuning forks. You yeah. Know, that's what, that's the term like that you used. Around tuning around for, yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. 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 I noticed this working in, in a very impoverished area and, and working with people who are, um, in poverty, it seemed like the, um, people would have a run of bad luck and it would just sort of multiply, you know, and it, the hardest thing was to try to get them to, to help them and to be with them and to coach them and to try to get the momentum going in a, in a different direction. You know, it seemed like bad things just kept happening to certain people. Of course, that through their choices, as you would say, they, 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 you know, they weren't helping themselves at all, but um, it's amazing what happens when people start to get around people that have some hope and and are uh, are willing to help them go in in a in a different direction and coaching them how to on how to make some different uh, decisions as well. Yeah, that and you know I see so many people who uh, it's like in that place or space where somebody has given up hope. It's 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 often easier than we would imagine to restore that sense of hope for somebody and and you know if somebody would just look into our eyes and acknowledge us as a being and just say hey i see you you have value i want you to know no matter what has gone on and no matter who has not seen that in you i do and i'm here just being with you and seeing you and you got this. I know you have the capacity to change this. Whether you want to or not is totally your choice, but I see you and you are not alone. It's one of the, it's, it's, it's the beginning, but it's also simpler than many of us have imagined, but we've actually got to be real when we do it. We have to actually mean it. And that can transform somebody's world. Yeah. Yeah. So while we're on the subject of hope, and maybe you've talked about some of this already, but you know, how do you find hope when the world feels bleak? It, it seems like COVID is going on forever and ever, and uh, our political problems are continuing, depending on who you who you talk to. You know, some people might think it's going great, and other people are thinking. I just actually my conversation prior to you is was talking to someone who doesn't think things are going all that well, and particularly in the US. So how do you encourage people to find hope when things uh, feel kind of bleak? Well, here's the first thing we need to get is what is true for us and it's individual. What's true for us makes us feel lighter. A lie makes us feel heavier. Hmm. So if you're watching something, if you're browsing the internet, if you're watching TV and you start going down a black hole of heaviness, change the channel, change the website, turn it off. Or if you're talking to somebody where that's happening, I'm sorry, I need to go home and wash my cat now. You know, get out of there. Because we need to be, we need to actually, oops, hitting the microphone, sorry. We need to actually care for ourselves because who else is gonna do it? In other words, if we can recognize that truly, this idea of what's true for us makes us lighter. And if we start choosing more things that make us lighter and make us happier over time, that is what our life becomes. It's just that so many people have gotten embroiled in the idea that they need to dive into the heaviest, yuckiest thing and somehow pull a gold nugget or a ball of light out of it. And that's their job, but it's actually not. And it doesn't help anybody because once again, if you're the one who has the capacity for hope, and you dive down into the cesspool with everybody else and you're drowning in the cesspool with them, you can't throw them a lifeline from, from the outside of the cesspool and pull them out into the clear pool that's right next door that you know is possible. So one of the greatest gifts we can give ourselves is start actively seeking those things that make us lighter and make us happy. And even if it's cute videos of kittens online, <clears throat> I mean, I sat the other night and I watched, there was something, it was these random acts of kindness that will restore your faith in humanity. And it was on YouTube. And there were hundreds of things on there where I was crying. I was laughing. I was like, yeah, this is us. You know, and it's a reminder of what's true for us that, and when I say that thing of what's true for us makes us lighter, 
that's really those sorts of things are actually what is true. And the more we embrace that, the more we surround ourselves with that, the more we actually live as that. And we also know it is a possibility. And we also start to look for it more in the world. What the world has done right now is tried to get everybody to fight everybody else and get them to believe they have to stay in their home or they're going to die from something that kills as many people as the flu, if you look at the CDC website. But did I say that? No, that was bad. Um, as, as a way of trying to create separation and create people going into as much heaviness and darkness as possible, I say, F that. Let's make a different choice. I don't care if the entire world is telling you, you need to sit in your home and be unhappy and be separate. I'm like, sorry, not me. Uh, your rules do not apply to me. My rules are, I'm going to create my reality. I'm going to be totally aware of what's going on out there, but I'm not going to buy any of it if it makes me heavier. And so I'm going to start choosing the things that make me lighter, meaning I'm going to call people up and still be funny. I'm going to call people up and tell them how much I care about them. I'm going to make videos that make people laugh. I'm going to make as many videos as I can to give people tools to get them out of the crap and stop buying the lies that make them heavy because anytime you're buying a lie, you get heavy. And that's why so many people are heavy is because there's so many lies that so many people are getting so heavy, they don't know what to do. Pardon me, my ADHD rant just went on a, went on a, <laughs> whoo. <laughs> that's okay. You know, it seems like as, as you're saying that, I'm, I'm in, in total agreement with you. Uh, it, it seems, I, I just speaking for some, maybe some of our listeners, it seems like uh, it's kind of unrealistic. Like people, for some reason, people resist um, light and being optimistic. And um, why do you think that is? Like what, what keeps people from doing these types of things that you're, you're talking about? What keeps them from um, looking for the things and participating in things that make them lighter in the first place? Well, first of all, thank you for bringing that up. And you are so correct. And also, I want to acknowledge it's not easy. <laughs> you would think it would be, but it's not. It's not easy to buck the entire river that is coming at you of, no, everything is wrong. We're going to hell in a handbasket. So number one, you've got to be willing to be different than other people, which is one thing people we're so used to in training to others where our tuning fork vibrates like theirs. If they're in sadness, we think we're duty bound to go into sadness. Otherwise we don't care. Otherwise we're not good people because if we see people suffering, then we should be suffering too. Except once again, if they're suffering and you go into their suffering, that's not your suffering. Number one, it's not yours. So you can't change it. And number two, you can't contribute to these beautiful people who are believing that this is their only choice. And you may be the only awareness of choice beyond it. And we're not desiring to do that. Most people would rather not be different. And most people would rather be followers rather than leaders. And a true leader is somebody who knows where they can go. They know where it's possible to go. They know what will create the greatest and they'll go regardless of anybody goes with them or not. So a true leader doesn't require followers. And most people have not put themselves in that position or seen themselves in that position. And if you look at it from the time we were little, it's like, if you look at little babies, they're pretty light, they're happy. You know, there's a reason we like to be around babies and we like to be like play with them and coo at them and stuff. And they're like, ha, 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 you know, and you might be having the worst day in the world and you see a baby and it smiles back at you with absolutely no judgment and you're melted, you know? And so what we've got to realize is we've, we've grown up in a world of judgment. We've grown up in a world that tells us that you need to judge everything you are and everything you do. You need to fit in. And we have been made wrong from the time we were little kids if we were different, if we were too much. I mean, look at what kids do on the playground to kids who are different. They make fun of them. They beat them up. They let them know that they're wrong for being different. And so here we are. We live in a world full of, of buff-colored sheep who are all trying to be more sheeply than the next. When in actuality, the people listening to this podcast or watching it are the neon colored sheep, you know, and they've been trying to cover themselves up with dirt so nobody notices. And what I'm here to say is your difference is your gift. It doesn't even matter if your entire life you've been made wrong for it, because my point of view is what if everything you thought was a wrongness of you is actually a strongness of you? And it actually is like even the ADHD capacity that a lot of people have where their brain goes like mine. I mean, I've got ADHD to a degree that is off the charts. You know, people are like, are you taking medication for that? I'm like, why would I take medication for a superpower? That is crazy. 
okay? Because even that, that's an ability to hold simultaneous realities in existence in your world and be able to access all of them simultaneously. Well, so what we have is these amazingly sensitive, amazingly aware, amazingly caring, amazingly healing creatures walking around this planet trying to pretend that they are none of those things so they can fit in and so they are not the effect of other people's judgments. And the difficulty is one of the things we never taught our kids is judgment has no power, you do. And we are the ones who give judgment power. And we've been doing that since we were little. And, you know, look at, you know, today's society is all about how many likes do you have? How many people are following you? Rather than how do you feel about you today and the choices you're making? And what else can you choose? And what else can you create that nobody else can and what about heading in that direction? Because anybody who's willing to head in that direction, that's when people are like, oh my God, what are you doing? I want to do what you're doing. Your difference is your gift. That's great. That's a quotable quote. Well, <laughs> pull that one out for the show notes. I like that. <laughs> yeah, pull that one out. Yeah. <laughs> um, something I know that I, I was guilty of a lot of my life. I, I, I felt like I was terminally flawed. And uh, I spent a lot of time, a lot of my efforts, a lot of the things that I did, um, including my involvement in religion and stuff like that, was trying to find a fix, you know, <laughs> but you say fixing yourself isn't the solution for happiness. Maybe you could tell us a bit more about that. Well, let me tell you that I also had exactly that point of view. I am fundamentally flawed. There is something wrong with me. And what I found in working with hundreds of thousands of people around the world is that there's about 50% of the population that has that as their point of view. The other 50% just knows they're right and everybody should do what they want. And, you know, I've even gone into categorizing them as almost like two different species, you know, because, because basically the person who believes they're fundamentally flawed is because they have a fundamental awareness that they are different than the norm. They cannot fit their multi-sided uh, dodecahedron into the square hole that they're trying to fit into, you know? And it's not even square peg in a round hole. It's, you know, this multi-dimensional peg that doesn't fit into that hole. And yet, if you look at that, if it, when somebody starts to embrace that, they start to have a different sense of the gift that they are. And the reason we feel wrong is because we don't fit into reality as the structure of judgment that it has been created as. Now, reality doesn't have to be that, but it has been that ever since we've had one. And you could say that's because of being cavemen and getting, you know, and going into society and blah, 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 blah. We could talk about the why forever. The fact is that we are taught to judge at a very young age. And it's those of us that don't understand judgment that believe that we're somehow bad people and we're somehow judgmental and we don't understand how reality works when in actuality the fact that we don't understand judgment is one of our strongnesses because it allows us to actually create which is actually what the world requires right now what's occurring in the world right now is the old structures of knowing what to choose based on choosing something like the past but a little better is gone and so the structures of what to choose based on judgment, based on this is right because we've always done it, and this is wrong because we've never done it. And in fact, right and wrong period are melting. And yet those of us who are the people that think we're judgmental and also think that we're fundamentally flawed because those two go together. The people that believe they're judgmental are also the people that believe they're fundamentally flawed. And so... The thing is, let me put it this way. Somebody who is truly judgmental never thinks of themselves, oh my God, I'm so judgmental. They just know they're right and everybody else is wrong. And so if you look at that, the people that are thinking they're judgmental of others actually aren't. They're actually in judgment of themselves because they can perceive the judgments of other people and they think they're theirs. Well, those are also the same people who think they're wrong and fundamentally flawed because somebody who is judgmental, truly judgmental, they never think they're wrong. They never think they're flawed. They're right and everybody else is wrong and everybody else is flawed. So if you look at these two different types of the way people function, 
the people that are having higher suicide rates now, the people that are having uh, a sense of, oh my God, I don't know what to do and are getting more and more and more stressed out about it are the second type, the people that think they're flawed, think they're judgmental, that actually are not flawed, nor are they judgmental. They just don't fit into a reality of judgment. They don't know how to do it. And they've learned how to do it from the time they were little kids because before that, they just wanted to go and play and create. And then you learn that you can't just go and play and create. That doesn't work. And so you learn to fit into a structure of a reality that truly is not real for you. And whenever you're doing something that's not real for you, it always feels wrong and you always feel out of place. And so we call those the humanoids, the people that are the seekers of the world, the ones that are in judgment of themselves and think they're judgmental, but the only person they ever judge is themselves. And they're, they're the weirdos, you know, they're the square pegs in the round holes, but they're the ones who every major advancement that has ever occurred to make the world greater, it's been by those guys because the other ones are only interested in maintaining the same thing and being right about it. And so rather than wrongness, which is why I say, what if everything you thought was a wrongness of you is actually a strongness? Yeah, good stuff. Um, and and I, I look at those, I look at the other 50% and, and sometimes wish I was more like that. I didn't have that or had more of that attitude. Like, you know, I'm right, you're wrong and who cares? Like, but uh, I can't help but care about it. You know? that. Yeah. So, you know, maybe we could talk about this a little bit more too, is just, you know, tips on silencing your inner critic. Again, when I saw this on your list of topics, I thought, well, there's, there's me again. And, and, you know, in, in some of the men's groups and stuff like that, that I'm a part of and in sponsoring people there and, and, um, and just being self-aware, I know that uh, my inner critic is sometimes, you know, the volume is up, up near 10 or 11, you know? Yeah. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could share some tips on how to silence our inner critic. Well, one of the first things is number one, to recognize that judgment is something that we have learned. And we have this fundamental sense because anybody who's going to be part of a men's group is going to be this other 50% I was talking about. <clears throat> okay. The, and let's look at that even for a moment. The, these guys, the humanoid men of the world are the sensitive, they're sensitive, they're aware. A lot of them are highly emotionally intelligent and highly emotionally aware. And so they have been told their entire lives, they, they most of them secretly, even if, if they're straight, they secretly fear they must be gay because they have the qualities that are as, uh, traditionally associated with feminine, which is why for me, feminine and masculine has a totally different perspective. So if we look at that though, then you also realize that in this 50%, the women tend to have a lot of the qualities typically associated with the masculine. They tend to be warriors who wanna change the world. They tend to be the people that are like, get the heck out of my way because I'm not putting up with your crap and I'm here to change the world. And so you have that dichotomy that people are dealing with in addition to everything else here. So, um, well, no, okay. Um, I'm just looking because there are so many tools and so many conversations we could have, including something called a clearing statement that basically goes back to the point of creation of wherever you created a limited point of view. And it's, it's dynamically changing, but I think it might be a little beyond the scope of today's conversation. So let me go another direction. Pardon me, that was giving verbiage, verbality to my ADHD. <laughs> Thinking um, out loud, yeah. Let's <laughs> let's keep it as simple as, as possible, okay. I guess. <laughs> so, so let's look at this then. Um, one of the things that we found is 98% of your thoughts, your feelings, and your emotions do not actually belong to you. And 98% of your judgments. You know that tuning fork we were talking about? Well, Thoughts, feelings, emotions, and judgment actually are a vibration of energy. They have a frequency. They have a wavelength to them and specific to each one. And, uh, you know, and science can back that up. And so what happens is 98% of your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions, and your judgments aren't actually yours. We pick them up from everybody around us. 
So there's a tool that we have in Access, which is called, who does this belong to? And if you'll ask, who does this belong to? To every thought, feeling, and emotion, every judgment, every yuck or stuck energy that comes up, if it lightens up at all, it's not actually yours. Now, if something's not yours and you're perceiving it so intensely that you think it is yours, you'll then tend to make it yours and then try to find the source of it, but you can't if it's not yours. If it's not yours, the only thing you can acknowledge is, wow, I'm aware of this. Okay, interesting vibration to be aware of and return it to sender. Because if you're not the source of it, you can't change it by looking at you as the source. So if you ask, who does this belong to, to every thought, feeling, emotion, judgment, and yuck stuck energy that you have for three days, at the end of three days, and, and if it lightens up, just return it to sender. You don't have to know who it is. At the end of three days, you walk around like you're in a walking, talking meditation. And we even created an app. It's called Access Consciousness. Who does this belong to? We're very creative in the naming department, as you can tell. Okay, it's free, it's our gift to you, because if you can even begin to get this awareness, which is a bit challenging for most people to get because they spent their entire lives thinking that everything they're aware of is theirs. But it, it would be kind of like if you're sitting in a room, you know, and you smell a fart, and you know, you didn't fart, right? And you're like, wait a minute, it would be the this would be the equivalent of convincing yourself that you had actually farted and that it was actually your fault it was your fault your fart when it actually isn't that's the same thing like how many times have you ever had been having a great day and you're driving down the road and all of a sudden you get hit with anger or fear or sadness or a sense of wow i really don't like my partner you know or something and you're like wait a minute now what happens is without this information what do you do you start looking back over your morning or your day from that point, walking back to try to find where this occurred and why, you know, and you'll walk back as far as you have to, even if it's years or days, months, whatever, you'll walk back and go, oh, that's why I'm angry at them. But what if you're driving and the person next to you just had an argument with their wife or their husband and they're being a rage monster driving down the road and you can pick up on that energy and you go, wow, I'm so angry. If we look at that, what's the difference between I'm so angry, owning it, and I perceive anger? Huge difference. When you go, I own, when you say I'm so angry, you have now just determined and concluded that this is yours and that it belongs to you and that you are having this experience and that you're the source of it. When you go, I'm perceiving anger, it's like, oh, I'm aware of something, which acknowledges your awareness, but also separates you from needing to experience it as though it's yours and then look for a reason and justification for why it's yours. It's a biggie, but look at the world we live in right now. There's a lot of people experiencing a lot of things. A lot of them are not pleasant. And I ask a lot of people, I'm like, okay, so we talk about who does this belong to? And they'll go, you know, I think I get it. I'm like, well, let me ask you a question. How much has your level of tension risen in the last two years? You know, and they go, oh, quite a bit. You know, I'm like, okay, how about, how about since the pandemic started? And they go, oh, well, definitely a lot then. I'm like, yeah, was it yours? They're like, well, of course. I'm like, no, look at this. How many people out there are buying into this thing and making it the source for everything and struggling with it? Because nobody's ever given them the tools to have something different. And they go, oh, billions of them. I'm like, yeah. Are you aware of those billions of people? And they go, oh, my God, yeah. I'm like, cool. So how much of it was really yours? And they go, oh, less than 1%. Cool. Now, are you capable of dealing with that less than 1% rather than that more than 100%? Much easier. Because if you could clear out 98% of what's in your monkey mind and only have to deal with the 2% that's left, Oh, so much more space and ease. That's fantastic. And I know a tool that I've used sometimes has been when related to self-inquiry. And it's like, you know, and, and the way I've asked the question is who's saying that? Like, is this coming from my 
true self or false self or what, where, where's that, yeah. where's that, what does that voice belong to? But your tool is, um, who does that belong to? That's a great, a great question. And then you've, you've created an app for that. And I'm sure, tell us a little bit more about the app. Like what does the app help people do? It, yeah. What it, what it does, it goes through and it explains it and also explains why it works. And one of the things, and so there are videos associated with the app, of like, here's how you do it, but it's also got a reminder on it because if you choose to do this, it will be, you will have to be really present, noticing when thoughts, feelings, and emotions are coming in, et cetera. And the way it works for most people is they'll, they'll do it for an hour. They'll forget for an hour. They'll do it for an hour, forget for 20 minutes, you know, on and off for three days, basically. And so what this does is whatever it has a reminder set at your preferred schedule of how often you want to be reminded, who does that belong to? Um, so that you can actually stay with it. Because if you do it for three days, at the end of three days, you walk around like you're in a walking, talking meditation, because you break the machine that makes you think that all this stuff you're aware of actually belongs to you. Mm. And so there are videos on there. And one of the in one of the videos, I explained that quite literally, this was one of the things that helped me end depression 21 years ago. I had this access consciousness bars session and which changed so much. And then I actually used, who does this belong to when the depression felt like it wanted to come back? And I would go, who does that belong to? And it would lighten up again. And I was like, oh my God, this was actually not mine. I was about to end my life for something that wasn't mine that I was picking up from other people around me. So that's one of the other conversations on the videos in the app. And one of the other conversations on the video is that a lot of people, especially this, the people listening to this podcast, once again, and I don't mean to create a separation, more of an acknowledgement that you guys are seekers looking for something different. And so a lot of the seekers of the world are actually healers and they desire to make the world a greater place. They desire to end people's pain and suffering. They desire to end the earth's pain and suffering. And what they'll do is they, more than others, will try to take on anything that is painful. And they seem to have an innate natural ability to do it energetically, whether they're a doctor, a housewife, an engineer, a podcast host, whatever, you know? And, and so they do this to try to make the world a greater place at their own peril. And so this is part of what starts to be able to unlock and change as a result. I had a really funny experience with this. I was doing my coaching training and during that, you know, you do these personality assessments and I realized that I'm someone who picks up on other people's pain. Like you're, you're talking about me. And at the end of that weekend, we went to some friends place. They were having some people over and I knew some of the stories. I knew some of what was going on. I knew that one couple was fighting. I knew that one, one couple wasn't very happy that another couple was there. Um, these, a couple people showed up, you know, quite inebriated already. And we were there to have sort of a wine tasting type of deal. <laughs> and I knew that that was annoying someone, someone else. And, and, you know, the conversation was getting a little bit off color and all that kind of stuff. And I was just feeling, um, yeah, I was just feeling everything, you know, yeah. but I felt quite good about just saying, I just saying to my wife and she was okay with it. Let's, let's go. Like, I'm picking up on all this stuff. I don't, it's, it, I, I don't know that I was, I wouldn't have put it this way at the time, but it was like, all that stuff is not my stuff. I don't need to immerse myself in this. It's not a, it's not a healthy environment for me right now. Let's, let's go. Let's, we were staying at a really nice place at the time. So I was like, okay, we want to get back there and spend some time there. And so anyways, that was one of the things I thought. And then I had another funny thought process as you were talking, I was thinking about some people who, um, you know, since COVID has been on, they've just been totally into the whole conspiracy thing. And um, I was thinking of <laughs> bringing them up, but that's, and, and, and uh, how, you know, what they're doing to themselves by just constantly putting out conspiracy messages and all that kind of stuff. But then I thought, this that's another perfect example like who does that belong to them doing that that doesn't belong to me like i just need to release that and let that go and and to be honest i i have done that quite quite what quite effectively but 
um, there are times where it still creeps in and gets, gets to me like, please just, you know, it's great that you're feeling that you're going through that. Not great, but acknowledging yeah. that. And, uh, but it's not mine. Like, okay, if you want to do that, then, then do that. You know, like that's, that's yeah. your thing. You know, I don't need to take that on. Yeah. And, you know, I just want to point out that thing that you said about being willing to leave the party and go back mm -hmm. to a really nice place. It's sure. like that, that kind of choice, mm -hmm. that's what we need to choose a lot more of. And, you know, and people look and go, well, how would people at the party feel? Who cares? It's not their life. They'll either get over it if they, or they won't. And if they don't get over it, you don't want them as a friend anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, if they don't get it, then they don't get it, you know? Yeah. And that sounds if they're harsh, not going to support my heart, if they're not going to support a healthy choice, then yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. If they're not, if they're not supporting a healthy choice, they're not supporting a healthy you, you know, and yeah, yeah, but not from resistance, just from the acknowledgement of that. And one of the other, one of the other things that sticks us a lot, since you brought up the conspiracy theory idea is like, if we can just acknowledge that, like you said, it's not mine. I don't actually have to go down that rabbit hole and not my rabbit hole. Not my rabbit, not my hole, not my rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, I'm not going to follow that one any further. But, <laughs> but one of the things that sticks us a lot is when there's a truth with a lie attached. So somebody will, there'll be something that is, there's a nugget of truth in there. And then somebody will attach all kinds of lies to it or come to all kinds of conclusions about it. Right. That's, yeah. what, that's what we tend to follow dynamically. And, and there are certain politicians that are really good at delivering truth with lies attached. Mm -hmm. Like there's this, but it occurred because of this, or there's this and here's the pieces of it. And, and they know that it will stick people and they're trying to do it on purpose. And so a lot of, a lot of what sticks us like that, you can just ask what part of this is true and what part of this is a lie spoken or unspoken. And once you get whatever part of it is a lie for you, then the whole thing dissolves. You don't have to put any more attention on it. Excellent. Well, so many things that we could we could talk about, but maybe we could wrap it up there and maybe we'll just have to have you back and talk to you some more sometime if you're open to that. Um, sure, I'd be happy to come harass people with my ADHD that I cannot put a lid on. <laughs> <laughs> now, have you written one or two books? I see one book here, The, the Body Whispering Book. Yeah, have, I, I've, I've co-authored about almost 30 at this point. Oh, okay. And okay. written 10. All right. Um, yeah. So what's your most recent publication? My most recent is called Body Whispering. Oh, okay. Okay. And Tell us a bit more about that. Tell us about well, that it's, book. it's this book that when you read it, ew, sorry, I keep it in my microphone. I'm not used to having the microphone there. Um, when you read it, it, it takes you on a journey of connection with your body and the, what it creates is a sense of gratitude, a sense of connection and a sense of actually liking this thing. And what that then creates is the ability to, you ask for something and you can actually change it. And so it's about, tapping in, listening to our body, but all the books that I write are, you read them and you go on an energetic, it just, it, it, I have no way to describe the way in which you, it has some exercises, but whether you do the exercises or not, you read the book and then you're different in this case, different and having a sense of connection with your body. And so this, you know, especially nowadays, this is one that is really extremely helpful because of so much going on with so many people's bodies. And yeah, do you find more and more people are becoming a bit more, I think it's a timely subject. It, it seems like it's something that's talked about a lot more today is just recognizing how you're feeling and what's going on within your body. I know from some of the meditation exercises I do. And when I first started doing them, you know, where you do a body scan, it's like, well, I've never really even been aware of the back of my head or, or never yeah. really, really thought about whatever part of my body before and just bringing awareness to it is, is kind of, is kind of new and to maybe feel what's, what's going on there. So yeah, it seems like a, a pretty timely, uh, subject What just describe briefly describe, a, a, um, one of the exercises in there. What, what can so people do? One of the exercises is 
to a, a really quick way of actually starting to get connected with your body is to ask your body for everything that concerns it. Like body, what would you like to eat? Not in a weird way and like an acknowledging way that your body's got its own point of view. It has a consciousness of its own and will contribute that consciousness if we'll just ask and just, just give it a moment of our time and energy. And so you, like body, what would you like to eat? You know, you're standing in front of the fridge and you'll see something or you'll be like, well, nothing in this refrigerator, let me order in. But if we ask our body, it has a different, uh, it, and it's really, really simple. Our bodies communicate with us all the time. It's just, we haven't been listening. And so for other things like body, what kind of movement would you like to do? Body, what would you like to wear? Which sounds, you know, people initially kind of go, uh, sounds a little weird, dude. And I'm like, I know, but try it. And what'll be interesting is you'll stand in front of the closet and say, body, what would you like to wear today? And you'll spy something in the corner that you haven't worn in years. It's in your never going to wear pile. You put it on and people go, wow, you look great today. And that's, that's this energy that is available when we actually listen to our bodies. And so it's about developing a sense of connection, a sense of gratitude. And we can start that by just acknowledging it has awareness and it it has points of view also and if we would follow that we could listen to the whispers which are a subtlety of energy like i'd like to wear this i'd like to eat this please don't go here oh you're in the sun too long you need to get out like those sorts of things and we wouldn't require the shout or the brick across the face which is what we consider disease or pain you're making me think of courtney dewalter she's a um ultra marathoner and uh, she's just, she's, you know, winning. She's been winning lots of races lately within the last few years. And she's just a phenom and people keep trying to figure out what she's doing. <laughs> and uh, you know, what, what's really interesting is that she's not really following any set training schedule. Hey. Uh, yeah. I listened hey. to a, a podcast with her on, um, on rich roll. And I've, I've, I, I've considered doing some ultra marathons and stuff like that. And so, you know, came across her but day by day she's just listening to her body i don't know if she's asking her body what it, essentially she is it sounds like she is she's yeah. asking her body what how should i train today what should i do today and it sounds yeah. like some days she'll maybe not train at all and other days go for who <laughs> like a massive run or whatever she's just she's just listening and and people are just scratching their heads like how can you do that and then you know one of these hundred mile races comes up and she beats everybody by 20, 30 minutes or, or more, you know? <laughs> I love that. That yeah. is exactly what I'm talking about. Okay. Yeah. She's one of those humanoids I was talking about Yeah, where exactly. it's like everybody else, like I've got to do this and I got to watch calories. I got to do this. She's like, nah, I had tacos and beer last night and yeah. I still kicked your butts, you know, yeah. <laughs> but that's the way we are when we're being us. It's like, we have these miraculous ways of being with things and with our body. And I know I get really intense, you know, passionate excited because this is us like we are way more alive we have way more capacities than we have been pretending and we're the only ones who can be inspired enough to go hey i'm going to choose something different i'm going to i'm going to see what it's going to take to for this to show up and a great question that you can ask is what else is possible that i've never considered mm -hmm. and what's it going to take for this to show up or what's it going to take to change this if there's something you want to change and functioning from that question is one of the greatest gifts we can give ourselves because you might be like she is. You just don't know it. You've never asked the question. Right. You've just been trying to go into the linear of what we're supposed to and what we're not capable of rather than what are we capable of that we have never even considered. Hmm. Have you practiced that? And what's? can you give us an example from your own life? Like what's come up for you? Oh, that's a great question. I love that. I can imagine some incredible things coming up, but what, what, what's I, been your experience with that question? Oh my, I cannot tell you so many things. I mean, sure. from, from, from creating a business that when I started had, we were in two countries that is now in 176 countries that grows mm. roughly 16 to 20% a year. Although in COVID it went back to 13% a year. Um, but grew even during COVID and that's one, but also with my body, it's like, I, like I started barefoot running and mm. it was just like, it, it just, the ease of 
everything. It, it's, it was so phenomenal to me because I was like, okay, I'm going to have all these problems. Nope, no problems. And I had a, um, I had a, what, I can't even remember what it was right now. What was, oh, I, oh, let me tell you, this is a, a very interesting one. Okay. So I was on a horse, I was behind somebody else and their horse went up on both legs and kicked back with both legs full force into my horse. And it also caught my left knee. And mm. I have never experienced a level of pain like that in my life before. I screamed at the top of my lungs. I went to get off the horse. I could put absolutely no weight on my leg and um, rode back. Anyway, we got back to uh, our little casitas where we were staying and I had some friends. I'm like, look, we need to use some of these access consciousness tools and work on me because I cannot walk. And I was facilitating class that day. I could put absolutely no weight on it. My leg felt like it was dangling under um, you know, my lower leg felt like it was dangling from my upper leg. And I was like, Whoa, this is, this is not bueno. And being a chiropractor, I know, you know, all the orthopedic tests, I failed all of them. Okay. So I was like, well, this is interesting. I wonder what else is possible. I've never considered. And what is possible beyond this reality? And if this stuff we're doing really works, can I please get an example of it right now, please? You know, I was just like, <laughs> Because we also have these body processes and access consciousness that help us change things that that help give the body the energy it needs to change things on its own. Okay, so I had friends work on me for forty five minutes while I did this other um, while I was asking some questions and running some verbal processes. Forty five minutes later, I was able to stand and walk on that leg and go down and facilitate class. Within the next few weeks, I was at. Well, actually, I was at I was at about 80 to 85 percent function with pain in 45 minutes. And so I went to my chiropractor who's who was at was very orthopedically oriented at the time. And he's like, OK, so let's see. Do you have this? I'm like, no, and this was at the time. Uh, it was a week later. He said, do you have this? Do you have this? Do you have this? Do you have this? And I was like, no. But at the time, I had all of them. I had. I had, if you would have gone by the orthopedic tests, I had torn almost every piece of cartilage in my knee. Um, and somehow that was not the case after this. So I'm just putting that out there. And I've seen, I could give you thousands of stories of people who have done something similar, but this, my sense is we are capable of this my sense also is, I mean, just look at Wim Hof as another great example of, of what is possible. Look at the ultra marathoners. Look at, I mean, there's so many of these examples out there. We just tend to think we can't be one of them rather than how am I, how am I like that, that I'm not acknowledging. And, in, in, in what we can do is we can go, Hey body, show me like, Hey, I know I'm too dumb to get it, but maybe you can make me get it. You know, show me how amazing we are and please make it easy. You know, because we're capable of far more than anybody's been acknowledging. Yeah, for sure. Good stuff. Um, yeah, you have so you you asked so many good questions. I, I love I love the questions that you've brought up today. And uh, I'm just looking at your website here too, uh, Doctor Dane. Here it's d r d a i n h e e r dot com. And it's just full of resources. Is that the main place that if people want to get in touch with you and find out more, is that the main place that you would like people to go to? Yeah, I would say that's the best. And there's all kinds of resources. There are all kinds of free videos and free stuff. And then if you go to my YouTube channel, which is uh, also Dr. Dane here, I've got something like 400 videos of free tools. And please use me, man. Just go there and, and, and get, get better, get lighter, get happier consider it a gift from the universe. Um, Cause you know, this life can be friggin' amazing. And unless somebody tells us we're not going to get it. So I'm here to tell you, I see thousands of people that I work with that are living from that perspective and yeah, they have ups, they have downs, but their downs are so much less than they used to be. And their ups are so much greater. So it's not to say everything is perfect and you always be light and happy. No, you're going to have crap go on, but there are tools to handle it. And then you're always greater afterwards. So I just want to say life can be friggin' phenomenal. Let's do this thing together. You are not alone. Excellent. Thanks so much.